I am a homeschool mom of four kids, a nutritional coach since 2012, and a passionate learner about gut health and hormones. My name is Corinne, and I am a miraculous mama. everybody. Welcome back to the Miraculous Mamas podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Joy, and we believe in empowering women through storytelling and education. And we are so glad that you're here today. I have a lot to talk with you guys about before I bring the guest on. So I'm going to kind of dive right into it. So this last week was my birthday. I turned 33. And for some reason, I feel like that's a magical number. I've always had a thing with 333 and I see it everywhere. And I don't know. I was actually really excited to turn 33. It's crazy because I feel like I am 16 at heart still. And when I talk to my mom, she's like, I feel the same way. I'm still just 16 at heart. So I don't know if internally, I mean, besides, or I guess mentally, if we really, really age, but I'm excited to be in my early 30s. I feel like your 20s are full of crazy lessons. And in your 30s, you're just more confident in who you are. And life just continues to get better from here. Um, You guys, so February has a lot of goodness in it. There's a lot of different awarenesses going on and things like that this month. But one thing that I wanted to talk to you about real quick is that February is National Condom Month. And for those of you that didn't know, Um, condoms are 98% effective for birth control, whereas the pill is only 91% effective. So if you're looking for a more effective form and you've been on hormonal birth control, condoms can be really effective when they don't work properly. Um, it's because you're not properly educated on how to use them. And a lot of guys use the wrong size because they think that they are different than what they actually are. So when, They are coming off during the act. That's because the sizing's not right or it's not put on correctly. Um, But when used correctly, they are 98% effective. Um, It's also great for obviously preventing STDs and things like that. Um, Condoms are where it's at, guys. And it is National Condom Month. So I just wanted to shout that out. If you guys need any tips, um, or want to read up on it at at all. Um, There's a lot of things going on online, hashtag condom month. Uh, Visit the ASHA to learn more um, about your health and taking charge and being safe. Um, They offer a lot of free downloads of fact sheets for male condoms and female condoms at the ASHA. All right, guys. So today's episode... We're going to be talking about sleep a little bit, and it is very, very important. And I was doing a little bit of research before the episode, and statistically and scientifically, adults need seven or more hours of sleep per night for the best health and well-being. And that comes from the um, American Psychology Association. And we talk a little bit about in this episode how um, lack of sleep also is linked to mental health and and stuff like that. So it is super important to get good rest. And, and it really does filter into a lot of your other areas of your life, into your relationships, your health, your well-being, all of that. And... Um, I know seven hours might seem impossible, but you might get some tips on today's episode of how to um, get that, to strive for that. It says that 35% of adults don't get enough sleep, according to the CDC. So, um, And 20% of teenagers are getting less than five hours of sleep. So that's pretty crazy. Teenagers these days, I guess, just are not sleeping. But if you look at sleep over the last, I don't know, 80 years. In the 1940s, the average was eight hours a night. And now it's about 6.8. And so we've definitely dropped. We're not prioritizing sleep. And um, and it's, I don't know, it's crazy. I know that the different seasons in your life definitely affect that. Um, But there's a lot of different statistics. They say that healthy sleep duration is more common among married people Um, because you kind of have that partner or that comfort. Um, 
And 37% of people between 20 and 39 years old reported short sleep duration. So if you think about it, between 29 and 39, a lot of times during that time where you are getting not enough sleep, it's parenting years and like striving for your career, college, whatever it may be. And that's also when your body needs it. So it it is important to check up to take care of yourself. It's an act of self-care to give your body that time at night to be able to sleep, to restore, to heal itself, to recover. And um, yeah, I'm super excited about this episode. Uh, I have Chrissy Lawler on and she is just so amazing. She's um, a sleep expert. She's a marriage and family counselor, and she just has a lot of information to offer us. Um, we don't only talk about sleep for moms and, and ourselves. We talk about sleeping for your kids and how that can be really beneficial when your kids are sleeping well, how you can also sleep well and things like that. So um, she just has a lot of information to offer us. And she does clarify at the end of it, we do talk about sleep training throughout it. Um, but it's not in the sense that you may think. It's kind of for lack of a better word um, because there's so many different methods and different things work for different people. And she works with you in where you're at and and the type of parenting you you want to have and everything like that. But it's an amazing episode and I'm excited to bring her on. So I'm going to grab Chrissy. All right, everyone, I have Chrissy Lawler here and she is the peaceful sleeper. Uh, She's a marriage and family therapist and a sleep specialist. She's uh, passionate about helping moms feel more empowered in parenting. And a huge part of that is getting some rest. And I would argue just a huge part of feeling empowered in your life (laughs) in general (laughs) is getting some good rest. So thank you so much for being here, Chrissy. I'm so excited for what you have to say and offer everyone listening. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. So I'd love for you, I guess, to kind of tell us in your own words, what exactly you do and how you got into it. Yeah. So um, I'm a marriage and family therapist. I've been doing this for 10 years. And even before I had babies, I was realizing all the time that my clients that were the most stuck, the ones that were the most depressed, the most anxious, the most annoyed with their spouses, where it felt like nothing was really shifting those were the clients that had the biggest sleep problems. And as an insomnia sufferer myself and a perfectionist, I hated that my answer was like, oh yeah, sleep is hard. Um, Let's talk about the real stuff. And so I went ahead and I got trained to treat chronic insomnia. And that's where I learned, not surprisingly, but kind of surprisingly, that 80% of people with mental health problems have underlying sleep issues, Wow, which is so huge. And so I realized like, oh my gosh, the key to mental health and well-being <laughs> is getting good sleep. Yeah. And then fast forward, I had babies of my own and struggled with some postpartum depression, but I knew that it was because I was sleep deprived. And then anyway, fast forward, I dove into everything that I could about sleep training. I kind of hated it as a therapist. And like I said, as a perfectionist, I hated it that so many of the books and resources were very mom shaming. Mm. I felt like everything was very like fear driven. Like if you don't do it this way, then you're a crappy parent. And then somebody else is like, no, no, no. If you don't do it this way, then you're a crappy parent. And I was like, I just want to be a really good parent and I don't know how to do it, but I know that I need sleep and I know that my baby needs sleep. And so I kind of figured out my own method, blending in all of them together. And then I had another baby and it worked again. And I was helping my friends sleep train their babies. And I kind of realized like, wait, maybe I'm onto something that I can be a voice in this space that says sleep is really, really, really important. I researched attachment for years. That's another thing that kind of drove me nuts is so many people were like fostering unhealthy sleep habits in the name of good attachment, Hmm. which just wasn't correct. And I feel like a lot of moms now with all the resources that we have and all the stuff on the internet, like we can get really overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and kind of go into a rabbit hole of mom shame and fear. And so anyway, I just, I don't know. I just kind of realized that I wanted my voice in the space to help moms feel empowered and really restore the magic of motherhood that comes when everybody is resting well. Because like, 
like I said, I battled with postpartum depression and being tired and exhausted and looking at my sweet, perfect little baby, but not feeling that magic and Mm -hmm. then feeling guilty about it. And I realized like the magic totally came back when I had good sleep. Like, Mm -hmm. and I think even if we don't have kids, we all have those experiences where like maybe for some reason we got to sleep in really late or we just had this incredible night of sleep and you wake up and it's like the sun is shining and the birds are chirping and everything is just glorious. And we can have that every day if we get good sleep. Wow. I need that actually right now. I've been having some sleep issues. Um, (laughs) so, and and I, and I, I, I feel like whenever I see moms, like it is so freaking hard. And I know for myself, I don't even have kids. When I don't get good sleep, I have a hard time getting out of bed. And then I don't want to go out even in, during the day because I'm fortunate enough to work from home most days. But it's like, but if I do, if I get up early, I'm more likely to take my dog to the park and I'm more likely to get some sunshine and some fresh air and like other things. And it's like, I struggle just taking care of myself. Like how are these women with these kids doing it because I know if I don't get a good sleep, I'm a grump, you know? So I can't even imagine adding the kids on top of that. Yeah, totally. And I think like, yeah, when you set out to be a mom, like you envision all of these like happy, sweet moments and there still are those moments, but like anybody that has kids, I think can acknowledge that sometimes motherhood is just a grind Mm -hmm. and it sucks when it's like, oh, some of these days are a beat down. But the days that were well rested, when we can see the magic in the smudgy fingerprints, and like my daughter, she's one and a half. She dumped out an entire box of cereal on the kitchen floor this morning. She was like trying to pour it into her bowl. And then she just dumped a whole entire box of honey bunches on the floor. It was a giant mess. But like, that could be super frustrating. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to be vacuuming crumbs for days. Or like, oh my gosh, she's so cute. She just made such a giant mess. That's funny. And it's like the same exact experiences can either feel like a beat down or just feel funny and lighthearted, totally depending on your mood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like, gosh, if we can just have more joy in motherhood, how much better is the experience, you know? Yeah. All right. I'm going to take a break from this episode to talk to you about one of my new favorite items that I wear. And it's so hard getting ready for work sometimes and deciding like, okay, am I going to be cute or comfortable today? And thanks to Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants, you now don't have to decide, which is the life that I am talking about. They're stylish, comfortable, professional attire, and you shouldn't have to pick between comfort and style. And with Beta Brand, you don't ever have to sacrifice that. Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants are super comfy, perfectly stretchy, and they stay wrinkle free, which is very important for someone like me who does not iron. I hate to admit it, but I honestly don't even know how to iron. Um, I would use the dryer, but I love when I'm in a crunch and I have to be somewhere and these pants are wrinkle free and they always look cute and they are comfortable, so I can just throw them on. And whatever your style is, they have something to match that. You can choose from dozens of colors, patterns, cuts, styles. They have boot cut, straight legs, skinny, cropped, even more. They even have a pair with eight pockets. That's right, eight. And I like it because I usually have chapstick in at least two of them. (laughs) But now they also offer premium denim with the same flexibility and comfort as yoga pants. And now you can join nearly 1 million women who have introduced dress pant yoga pants into the workplaces around the world. And right now our listeners can get 20% off their first order when you go to betabrand.com slash mamas. That's 20% off your first order at betabrand.com slash mamas. Millions of women agree these pants are the most comfortable pants that you'll ever wear to work. Go to betabrand.com slash mamas for 20% off. Now back to the show. I liked how before you brought up mom shaming and because I feel like <clears throat> that's where the hard thing is because there is it were it's awesome that there's so many resources out there but it can also be overwhelming 
And so much of it is, yeah, if you do it this way, basically you're doing it right. But it, no, if you do it that way, you're doing it right. And then it's like, okay, mm-hmm. so any way I'm doing it, I'm a crappy parent and I'm just trying yes. to survive. And it, and, and moms do kind of judge each other. And I get it because it's everyone's doing the best that they can. So when you're saying, oh, well, I did it that way. You're almost like protective over your experience of like, well, I didn't do it that way. And this is working just fine for me. Thank you. <laughs> like, totally. You know, and it's yes. like, no, I'm not judging you. It's like, we can have different experiences, do things different ways, you know, but when it comes to sleep, that is scientifically proven. That's when your body heals, when it restores. And now all you hear is, I didn't sleep for eight years <laughs> while I was yes. having kids and breastfeeding. And totally. so it's like, how... How do you function during those eight years? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really tough. So, and that's one of the things that I talk about a lot is that there is no one size fits all approach because all parents are different and all babies are different. And so, I feel like I really use my therapy hat a lot through this process that says tune in, trust your mom gut. Like you are going to have those mom instincts that are going to lead you in the direction that you need to go. But we also need to be conscientious and careful about instincts because, you know, nobody likes to hear their baby cry, right? That is a parenting instinct, but like, that doesn't mean that your baby's actually in danger or in harm's way. And so if we can really like, really, I don't push one approach more than another. Like if you want to do full cry it out, I'll teach you how to do that. If you want to do modified cry it out, which I prefer, I'll teach you how to do that. If you want to do a no cry sleep approach, I can teach you how to do that. But I kind of just try and teach moms the basics of what their baby's sleep needs are, how to tune into baby's cues and how to figure out a parenting approach, not just with sleep, but across the board that works for you and is benefiting your child. Because we do need our kids to be gaining independence and resilience. We need them to learn self-soothing. Even if you want to do a no cry sleep approach, our kids still need to self-soothe because like they're going to get made fun of on the playground at kindergarten, or they're going to fall and they're going to bump their knee. Like We're not going to be there every single second of every single day. We need our kids to be equipped with skills and tools to be internally resilient. And honestly, I think that's one of the biggest factors of depression and anxiety being so on the rise right now is that parents in general have become super overprotective out of our own anxieties. And we're teaching our kids that the world is a really scary place. But instead, as parents, we need to tune into our anxieties, overcome our anxieties, and teach our kids that they are safe, they are fine, they are strong, they can do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I know that that's a big part of occupational therapy with children is not skipping those important steps because Mm -hmm. like you said, learning how to self-soothe does help benefit you later on, you know, and it doesn't mean listening to your kids screaming for 20 minutes um, to, to learn that skill, you know, but it is, I mean, my husband and I talk about it a lot because we're like, when we, when we were little, we would have to, I remember his family's big and Italian and they'd always have like these Italian parties. He was like, we'd pull benches together and pass out. We would, you know, he's like, I had to sleep anywhere I was. And I, you know, I remember me crawling under the pews at church and going to sleep and like totally. all sorts of stuff. And now I don't know. It's everybody's schedule is kind of catered to the kids, which I know mm-hmm. routine is so important. Also, routine can be really good because you're setting the kid up. It's like, okay, I turn the sound machine on, I hit the diffuser, the lights are dimmed, and it's your sleep time. And you know that that's, it puts your body in that mode. But mm-hmm. like, how, how do we not completely lose ourselves in motherhood to where like, you know, you want your kid to sleep well so that you can sleep well, but then your life's revolved around their sleeping? Yeah, I think it's a very fine balance. So kind of... How I manage the balance in my own life is I figure out, especially like when I'm sleep training, I figure out when their optimal sleep times are, and then I figure out my schedule. So I kind of have two different charts of like, this is when it seems like the baby wants to be sleeping predictably. And this is also what my life looks like. And so how can I plan out my life and baby sleep schedule and make it work? 
And like, I am one of those parents that kind of like, I try not to mess with my baby's sleep schedule no matter what, but I also still very much so have my own life. And so it's mm-hmm. like, all right, you're like, we were home for your nap and now we're going to be out because... I want to go to the park with friends or it's time for mommy to go to the gym or now we're going to do whatever, whatever. Or I also love like, cause I put my babies on a really early bedtime. My tiny babies are usually asleep by six or seven at night. And so then I'll just like put the baby down and have a teenage babysitter come over because the baby's asleep. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, Hey, just like stay home and make sure the house doesn't burn down. Baby's sleeping and me and the big kids are going to go do something or me and my husband are going to go do something. So I actually think having baby on a predictable routine helps baby because then they get the sleep that they need. But it also helps us as moms be able to plan our lives and not feel like we're sacrificing all the time. Cause like I always use as a barometer, like if I have a doctor's appointment that I need to schedule for next Thursday, do I know when the baby's going to be napping for a lot of moms? They say like, uh, I don't know what time's going to be a good time. Like Thursday's the whole week away. Like, I don't know when the baby's going to be napping, but it's like, Oh no, the baby's going to nap from 12 to two. So the rest of the day I'm free, you know, and you can kind of just plan accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that we also always say is like, it doesn't mean that our parents were doing it right either. Cause like we all grew up, like it was such a different time back then too. And totally. And so I definitely see what you're saying. Cause then it frees you up to be able to do other things as well, you mm-hmm. know? And, and also like you, if that is your life, if you're that person that like you plan things around your kid's sleep schedule. Don't, you don't have to apologize either. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like I've, I've heard so many moms being like, I'm sorry. We're like, we have to go. It's their nap time. And it's like, don't apologize. Like <laughs> go do your thing, you know? Yeah, totally. And I think it's, I think it can be so great to just be well connected to a good mom tribe because then you can also, I mean, I remember when we lived in Dallas, we had friends that would get together like once a week or every other week and do brunch at somebody's house. But it just so happened that it was right in the middle of the baby's nap time. So what did I do? I brought a pack and play and I put the baby down to sleep upstairs and I hung out with my girlfriends and had brunch. Or I had another great friend whose baby was the same age as mine and I'd pick up takeout. I'd put the baby to sleep in a pack and play in her bathroom or her walk-in closet and we'd have lunch together while the baby's napped. And it just, there's so many ways that you can still stay connected and still get out of the house and have your baby sleeping well. Yeah. So it just takes a little bit of creativity, but it's totally doable. Right. Yeah. I would love for, I mean, I'd love for you to touch on um, motherhood, I guess, and go back to sleeping and being a mom and um, just even how that affects motherhood, but also marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the marriage piece... You know, a lot of times, unintentionally, a lot of times as women, once we have babies, we kind of stop prioritizing our husbands. Like, sorry, you're a full grown man and I have this tiny baby, so I need to take care of the baby. Why are you so needy? Like, you're an adult, go take care of yourself. And sometimes our husbands can feel really replaced or undervalued all of a sudden because they are so tender at heart still and loving us is actually really vulnerable for them. You know, a lot of times we see our husbands as these like, these like big, gruffy, strong, burly men who we need to take out the trash and reach for high things on the shelf, but they so want to be loved. And I think sometimes when we get all wrapped up in our babies and we're catering to our babies, then our husbands just go on the back burner and it's like, I'll get to you when I get to you which most husbands can handle that well. But I think it's such a gift that they're handling that well. And I I don't think we should make them deal with that for forever or like have that be the new normal Mm -hmm. forever, you know? And so I think that when we sleep train, when our babies have predictable sleep schedules, it really opens up so much freedom to still have your marriage You know, I can't tell you how many women that I've talked to that say, you know, I haven't had sex with my husband in eight months because we have a baby in bed with us. And it's like, gosh, like having a good sex life is so critical for a Mm -hmm. healthy marriage. And I think a lot of women sometimes 
use the baby, unfortunately, as a buffer, like, oh, no, can't be intimate because there's a baby in the room, you know, because we're tired and maybe not in the mood or whatever. But I think being able to be well rested ourselves, have the energy to still be spouses and then be able to carve out that special time with our husbands to sit on the couch and watch a basketball game with them or watch a show at night or just be hanging out and be the former versions of ourselves. I think that's really important to keep the spark alive in marriage and let our spouses know that they are important. And like I said, you know, when your baby goes to bed at 6.30 at night, that means you have like a four hour date night every single night before you and your husband go to bed that you can just be hanging out. Or I love on Instagram when people will send me messages of their like Friday night date night in and they've got their glass of wine and their, you know, their meat and cheese board and they are sitting on the couch together just hanging out having a date night at home, the baby's asleep and they just get to be themselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I would just also encourage anybody listening to this, if you feel triggered by anything that's being said about maybe not having sex for eight months or different things to like lean into that and to explore your relationship a little bit. Because if you talk to most people and you ask, how's your marriage and they haven't had sex in eight months, chances are somebody's feeling like they're not fully connected or you're not where you were or it's not the optimal situation, you know? Yeah, Yeah, totally. Why do you think, I guess, because I mean, this new role as a mom is a lot. I mean, it does, things do change. Your body changes. The one thing that Mm -hmm. I hear from a lot of women is like, I'm touched out. I've had a baby, I've been breastfeeding. I've been, you know, all these different things. Like I am just touched out and somebody has needed something from me all day. So then when my husband comes home and he needs something from me, I'm like, don't even think about it. Like how, I guess if you're in that state though, it's like, how do you coming from, you know, a marriage and family counselor place, I mean, move past that or get into that state or... I mean, learn to put that aside or whatever it may be. Yeah, totally. So this kind of delves more into my sex therapist hat, which I I do a lot of sex therapy. So where I come from with that is that as, so if we think about the sexual response cycle, we have like desire and arousal, heightening, climax and resolution. But they're finding in the research that a lot of times after you've been married for a while, after you've had kids, for women, the desire just isn't really there as Mm -hmm. much. Like that's not the thing that gets you into bed is this like hormone surge that says like, Ooh, I want to be intimate. And so they've changed the word for willingness, which I think is really empowering for women that I don't have to base my sexual expression on this burning desire that I feel within my body. I can base it on willingness Do I feel willing to give myself to my partner? Do I feel willing to connect with him in this way? Am I feeling loved? Do I feel gratitude? Do I feel emotionally connected? So we can tap into a different part of love and connection and intimacy rather than just what maybe a lot of us relied on in our earlier years of like this hormonal drive for sex, it can turn more into a, an emotional drive for connection. I think also remembering that if you think about our biological instincts for sex, women, I think biologically women know that sex leads to babies, Mm -hmm. right? And so we do this internal check of do I feel ready in my life right now to have a baby? Like I haven't taken a shower in two days and the baby's been screaming all day and I'm exhausted. Like, can I add another baby to this chaos? Absolutely not. So back off, buddy. Mm -hmm. And so, so women need to feel loved and connected and a certain level of peace and calm before sex feels like a good option. But if you think about that biological response for men, men feel loved and connected through sex because, Mm -hmm. wow, if a woman is willing to have sex with me, that must mean that, that she actually loves me, that she chooses me. And so I find a lot of times in couples therapy that people just get into this negative loop of, you know, the women feeling like, I don't feel like you love me. I don't feel like you care about me. I don't feel like you're responsive to me. You only want my body and you're not going to get it. 
And then men feeling like, I don't feel like you love me. I don't feel like you want to connect with me. I feel like you only want my help around the house or my paycheck. And so you want me to like tell you nice, sweet, tender things when you have been rejecting me? Like, nope. And I don't think anybody does it consciously, Mm -hmm. but we just get in these loops and these cycles of disconnection and this subconscious thing of like, you're not meeting my needs, so I don't really want to meet yours. And when both partners are standing in that place, then it just fosters disconnection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes that definitely makes sense. And the, the thing that you hear from a lot of people is once they get back into the sex, the sex mm-hmm. into the sex, it's um, it comes easier again. You know, I totally. think it's almost like working out. Like when you haven't been to the gym in so long, it's so hard at first to bring yourself back. Yeah. And the same can be true like with your sex life. When you haven't had it for so long, your your hormones do change. But when you start bringing it back, those sexual hormones also start to, your libido changes as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would just say, like you said before, like for anybody that's listening, if this is triggering for you, like lean into that and figure out, because there are a lot of women that feel so incredibly disconnected from their spouses. And we can have happy marriages, you know, so go to counseling, read books, have good conversations with your spouse. Just like, you know, sleep can restore the magic of motherhood. I think a good, healthy, vibrant marriage can restore so much peace and clarity and joy in our lives. Yeah, no, that def- excuse me, that definitely makes sense. And I, I was just having a conversation earlier with... um someone close to me and we were talking about marriage counseling because I still feel like there is some sort of stigma around getting help or having counseling, but sometimes it's not even necessarily that something's wrong. Sometimes it's just maintenance work in your marriage and sometimes like situations change. You add a kid, you add a couple kids to it and it's like, wow, how we communicated with each other when it was just us is very different. How we communicate now and our needs are different. So maybe we just need to talk to somebody to figure out how to best communicate with each other. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. like, oh, we're on the verge of divorce or this isn't going to work. It's like, it can be an amazing maintenance tool for your marriage. Totally. I talk all the time about, yeah, marriage counseling as maintenance. And like, if you think about it, we ensure everything in our lives that are important to us. We have health insurance and car insurance and homeowners insurance and like all of the things. And so I think that couples should just budget in marriage insurance and whether that's money used to pay for marriage counseling or date nights, like everything that is important to us, we ensure. Mm -hmm. And so why not invest in insuring our marriage? And like you said, just going in, just like with our cars, like we go in for regular maintenance, we get our oil changed and our tires rotated. And we also go to the mechanic when there's something big happening, but it's important to have regular maintenance. And so my favorite sessions are those maintenance kind of sessions where couples are like, Hey, we actually really love each other and we want to keep it that way. So we're going to come in once a month or once every two months. And we're just going to learn some skills. Like, I think that's amazing. That's so inspiring for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I feel like sometimes there's just issues that every once in a while continue to cycle back around, you know, and you kind of work through it. And then months later, it cycles back around. And totally. And, and so it's like, okay, maybe we should dive into that a little bit. And so mm-hmm. then we can stop that cycle, you know, because there's always going to be something we're always changing and growing and, you know, and, and life changes and there's different seasons of life, you know, maybe somebody lost their job or you are entering motherhood or whatever it is. And so it's like if you recognize patterns or or something like that, it, it is always good just to to talk to somebody about it, at least recognize it and be like, okay, this thing comes up twice a year for the last five years. <laughs> maybe, yes. maybe we should work it out. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. John Gottman found that 80% of couples' arguments are about the same five to seven topics throughout the course of the relationship. So he calls those perpetual problems. And I think that's so true. Like probably everybody listening is like, "Uh uh-huh, yep, I can think of our five to seven 
different topics that we argue about. And so you're right. Counseling is a perfect place to say, okay, we keep circling back to the same thing. Let's actually figure this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love to go back to sleep because it's uh, one of my favorite things. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I also know, again, I don't have kids. Even in my own life, I go through cycles where I sleep so good and I go through Mm -hmm. cycles where I don't know why It's like, I'm dreaming a lot. I'm tossing, I'm turning. I'm just not getting good sleep. Maybe I ate sugar before bed. I don't know, you know, Uh but it seems to like be in seasons, but I know that you have just ways to get restorative sleep. And so Mm -hmm. I would love if you would share some of that with us. Yeah. So I also, like I said, I treat adult insomnia. And so honestly, the most important thing you can do to safeguard adult sleep, which is the hardest thing to do, is to get out of bed if you're not sleeping. Mm, we no, have, that's so hard. <laughs> I know. It's so hard. And I am guilty of like ignoring my own advice sometimes. And I'm like, come on, Chrissy, you know what to do. And I'm like, but I just don't want to. I just want to stay in my warm, cozy bed. But the problem is that when we we associate things, right? So like if you have ever taken like an early psychology class with Pavlov's dogs, like this experimenter, he rang a bell and then he fed the dogs and he rang a bell and he fed the dogs and he rang a bell and fed the dogs. And then he rang the bell and noticed that the dogs started salivating. Like they were anticipating food. And so we have conditioned responses. And what happens sometimes when we get into a negative sleep cycle is that we condition our bed with the place that we lie awake at night And the place that we do our to-do list or the place where we're on our laptop or checking our emails or we start conditioning our bed with this place of awakeness instead of our bed as the sleep spot. And so if we get out of bed when we're not sleeping and only return to bed when we are exhausted, then it retrains our brain to know that my bed is my sleep spot and that is it. And if I'm not sleeping, I'm not in bed. And we kind of train our brains too to say, I am so tired. I know that as soon as my head hits the pillow, I'm going to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Instead of what a lot of us do when we get stuck in bad sleeping cycles is like, I know sometimes I'll be like so exhausted and I'm watching a show or I'm cleaning the kitchen and I'm getting the kids to bed and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait until I go to bed. And then I walk into my room to wash off my makeup and brush my teeth and it's like, Like I'm wide awake and I tell myself like, oh, it's going to take me like two hours to fall asleep tonight. I just know it. And as soon as I think that thought, I plant it in my mind and I create that. Mm. And so we need to start believing from experience. Like I know that I will fall asleep when I hit the pillow. And so we only get that. We can only prove that to be true if we stay out of bed until we're actually going to fall asleep. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sucks. Like I'm not going to pretend that it's easy, but it's actually extraordinarily effective and we can nip, uh, you know, cause like you said, we do kind of go in cycles and I'll work with people a lot that it's like three months out of the year, I have this terrible insomnia and then it just gets better and I go about my day, but without fail, once February hits, I'm going to start having insomnia again. But just doing some of these little interventions. I talk all about it in an insomnia course that I have if people want to check that out. But just doing some little interventions can reverse insomnia in like two or three days sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Well, because I know for me, what's been happening lately is I go to bed and it's kind of a light sleep and then I'll be dreaming or something. And then I've been waking up around three, four in the morning, going to bed around mm-hmm. midnight, waking up at three, four in the morning and then just laying and then tossing and turning. And then I reach for my phone and I'm like, what do uh-huh. I have to get done tomorrow? <laughs> like you're saying uh-huh. the to-do totally. list. Cause it's like, uh-huh. well, now my mind's wandering. So I'm like, maybe if I just get everything out of my mind, I'll fall back asleep. Cause I remember, oh yeah, I need to go get some zucchini cause I wanted to make that thing. So like, yes. I'll remember the, the, the to-do list. So I'll write it down. And then before you know it, I'm checking my email and, um, you know, and I have a 50 long to-do list now because it's like everything I want to accomplish in my life is now written down. (laughs) And it's like, you know, it's, I don't know. And then I just feel like then I, then I turn it off and then I toss and I turn again and then I hear my husband get up and then I still lay there, but I'm telling myself like, you didn't get enough sleep yet. So you can't get out of bed. 
Uh Because you're going to be exhausted all day. So make yourself go back to sleep. But then I've been in bed for three hours not sleeping. Uh Uh-huh. You know. Exactly. And so really, and like I said, this is the hard thing. But really what you need to do is that day you say, okay, I'm going to be exhausted and I can survive exhaustion. I'm going to get out of bed and I can come back to bed if I, you know, because a lot of times like you, maybe you get up and you write your to-do list on the kitchen counter Mm -hmm. and it's still dark outside because it's three o'clock in the morning and everything is quiet. And you're like, this is BS. Like I want to go back to bed. I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to bed and you actually fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, sometimes we catastrophize our our fears of being tired. Like, oh my gosh, this wasn't enough sleep. I'm going to be so tired tomorrow. But if we can just reframe and say, you know what? Yeah, I am going to be so tired tomorrow. And you know what? I bet I'm going to get awesome sleep tomorrow night because I'm going to be exhausted and I'm going to fall asleep and I'm going to stay asleep all night long. And so this one night of really terrible sleep is going to get me a night of awesome sleep tomorrow. And that's a trade-off that I'm going to make because for some reason, my brain thought that it should wake up at four o'clock in the morning and we don't do that. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to practice that tonight. Um, What do you say, I guess, though, for... Because I've heard tons of different theories and whatever. So for new moms, let's say I just brought a baby home from the hospital. And Mm -hmm. so I'm waking up all the time. It's Mm -hmm. like, how do you get rest. I mean, even if you're waking up, feeding the baby, going back to sleep, um, like, is there a certain point where it's like, you should just get up and get ready for the day and whatever. So with brand new moms, I think all the rules kind of go out the window because we do need, if, you know, if it's your only baby and you have the ability to sleep when the baby sleeps, really getting good sleep is going to be your biggest protective factor for your mental health. And so I think sleep as much as you can when you're a brand new mom. Just be careful that your total hours of sleep during the day isn't creating problems for you at night. Mm -hmm. Because if you're getting four hours worth of naps during the day, then your body's not going to need six to eight hours of sleep at night, even if it's broken up. And so sometimes if we compensate too much, then it can throw off our nighttime sleep. But I think for new moms, that's honestly not usually a huge issue because I think new moms put a lot of pressure on themselves. Like, oh, the baby's napping. I could sleep or I could also do the laundry and shower and put on my makeup and be super mom and meal plan for the next week because I'm a mom now. And so I think most moms err more on the side of trying to do too much and they should put down the to-do list and just take a nap. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. But then once you add another kid to the equation, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit then harder. Then you just grab another cup of coffee and power <laughs> through. <laughs> right. And I feel like though that's the thing that, that is so hard because you know we're talking about how sleep is so important. It's been linked to mental disorders, to postpartum depression and anxiety, um, marital problems, like totally. all sorts of stuff. But when you have kids that are waking you up in the night, it's like how do you power through all of that? Yeah. So really one of the biggest pieces of my method is that for babies, sleep begets sleep. So the better they sleep, the better they will sleep. A lot of new parents treat baby sleep like adult sleep where I said like, no, we don't want to be in bed if we're not sleeping. Like, you know, we need to sleep deprive ourselves. So we'll get better sleep. But that is the opposite for our babies because then they get wired and tired. And so like, Most moms have probably had this experience where your baby's so tired and you know that they're exhausted and they're just crying and they're not falling asleep and you're like rocking them and you're like, what the heck is going on? I know that you're so tired. Just shut your brain off and go to bed. And it's because they've gotten in that overtired state. And so one of the biggest parts of my method is to optimize daytime sleep and that will benefit nighttime sleep. So Mm -hmm. even for newborns, before we're doing any cry it out at all, because our newborns don't know how to self-soothe. If we can optimize daytime sleep and make sure that we're getting good full feedings, then a lot of times those night feedings just drop off on their own. Mm -hmm. Like for the first month, it's going to be kind of a crapshoot no matter how you slice it. Like you're just going to be up a lot. But really after that, after like four to eight weeks, you really should, you, you can 
only be waking up once or twice a night to feed the baby. So these like, you know, the baby sleeping or waking up every two hours in the middle of the night to eat, usually that's a problem with daytime sleep. Mm -hmm. And so the, the period of powering through being so exhausted can and should really only be like four to six weeks in the beginning. And then things should start to gel and fall into place. And for most of us, like, okay, I can handle a really tired month. I'll nap when the baby naps. I'll ask for help. You know, a lot of us, I think this goes into like more of just parenting and relying on your mom tribe. But like, if you had a girlfriend that said, I'm so tired, can you come over and snuggle my newborn while I take a nap? I think any of us would be like, heck yes, I want to come snuggle a baby. Mm -hmm. And so really we just need to ask. But if we can get good sleep habits in place and rely on our mom tribe, it's really just that first month or two where we're really in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And then everything can start to gel after that. And especially after all those nights of broken sleep, like if you're only waking up once or twice at night to feed the baby for 15 minutes and then they're going back to bed, like you're feeling pretty fine, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I have a couple more questions. What about, um, so I guess there's like certain phases with babies where they have sleep regressions. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had some moms in our Facebook group talking around like 15 to 17 months, there's like a sleep Uh regression. And I think there's Uh one before that. Do you have any Mm -hmm. tips for the women kind of dealing with that? They're like, I've been getting great sleep and now my kid won't sleep. (laughs) Like what the heck? Yes. So I have a guide on that on my site too. But basically we have the four month sleep regression, which really is the perfect time to sleep train because that's when newborn sleep shifts to older baby sleep and they're ready for an earlier bedtime. They're ready to learn how to initiate sleep on their own because they're capable now of deeper sleep. So the four month sleep regression is kind of the big one that everybody talks about. There's another one around eight months and another one around 10 months and another one around 12 months and then like 15 to 18 months. But usually sleep regressions can be very short lived. So the very best thing to do is just stay consistent. We don't need to like read into the sleep regression and say like, oh no, everything was working well and now it's not. So I need to change a bunch of stuff. Usually those sleep regressions happen when our babies are on the cusp of some milestone. That's why the 15 to 18 months one, and it doesn't last those three months. It's just, it hits some babies around 15 months and some closer to 18. But that's one where their world is just exploding. Mm -hmm. Like their language is developing. They're getting more mobile. They're getting interested in books and pictures and all of the things. And so they kind of start to develop this baby FOMO. It's like, I want to be awake for all of it. This is so exciting. And our 15, like babies that age are also really developing their will and their personality. And they're realizing like, oh, if I just throw a fit, I can get mom to do what I want her to do. So I think that older sleep regression is more overwhelming for parents because all of a sudden their babies that were sleeping so well are all of a sudden protesting super hard. And they're like, what's wrong? She must be dying because she's (laughs) screaming at me. Mm -hmm. And this isn't how my baby usually is. But also remind yourself, like, I remember when London was in the thick of her like 18 month sleep regression, she also like absolutely lost her mind and threw a fantastic fit because I wouldn't let her touch the toilet brush. And so (laughs) like when I realized like, oh, she sounded exactly like this earlier today when I wouldn't let her touch the toilet brush, she's actually fine. She's just pissed right? because she wants me to stay in there with her all night long. And so like sometimes just doing a little bit of a reset, you know, after I sleep train, I don't really do cry it out a ton after that because the babies just fall asleep well, you know, but I would do like 10 minute checks. Mm -hmm. you know, and just come in every 10 minutes, like London, what's going on? Go night night. It's time to go to bed. And there's sometimes that I would lay on the floor and hold her hand through the crib bars until she fell asleep. But that was like a two or three day thing. Mm -hmm. And then we'd resume to business as usual instead of where I think a lot of parents go wrong is a sleep regression happens. So they start doing new habits and then they don't go back to the old habits And so now you've been falling asleep on the floor, holding your baby's hand through the crib bars for the last month, and you're really ready to be done. But it's like, that was a great intervention for like two or three days. And then we should have gone back, Mm -hmm. you know, 
Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. Totally. I would um, love to just ask, at what point do people hire you um, to help them with the sleep stuff? Um, I know a lot of experts, they're like, I wish somebody would hire me like at this phase, but usually it's like when they're desperate and already, uh-huh. you know, their kids is six month old, they haven't slept for six months and then you come in type thing. Uh-huh. Totally. Yeah. So the best time to hire me is at four months. Mm-hmm. The earlier, like if you can sleep train between four and five months, you are set up so well and it's really quick and easy. Like you said, a lot of people hire me when they get really desperate. I try to have a lot of resources on my site. I have 25 troubleshooting guides. I have a newborn course. I have a baby sleep training course. I have an insomnia course, but I do, like you said, I do in-person consultations or over the phone. So there are a lot of different options depending on how much people, what level of intervention people want. Like I will fly to your home and stay with you for four days and sleep train your baby for you. Like that's something that I'll do and show you every, you know, while we're sitting there and baby rubs his eyes and say, okay, he's tired now. And they're like, what? I just thought he was bored. Like, nope, he's tired. Let's put him down. Um, so yeah, I guess the short answer to your question is four months is the best time to hire me because it's the best time to sleep train. But most of my clients, babies are a little bit older and they're feeling a little more desperate. Yeah. And what would you say, I guess, to the people listening who they hear the word sleep train and they immediately think, negative things. Like I'm totally. going, like there's, there is a lot of weight I feel like around sleep training. Cause there's the sleep training moms versus the not sleep training moms. And it's like this versus thing instead yes. of like, you know what I mean? It's like, Oh, sleep training. So I'm going to torture my child and whatever. Like that's what comes to mind for a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And that's a big hurdle that I've had to overcome. Cause I don't know what else to call it. Right. But you're, but like, so one thing that parents say a lot is like, children aren't to be trained. Like there, it's not a dog. Like I don't want to sleep train my child. And it's like, but hold on, like we potty train too. And that doesn't feel this like awful and mean, like training is molding and encouraging a certain behavior. And so I, I think a lot of people that have really negative reactions about sleep training are envisioning the horror stories that you hear. Like you put a baby in a crib and they scream for three hours until Mm -hmm. they finally give up and fall asleep. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not what this is. Like there, we are tuning into baby. We are tuning into mom. We are building attachment. We can allow for a certain level of time to figure out self-soothing, but it's always with intervention. It's always with mom coming back in and babies. The other thing that I say all the time is that attachment is formed over thousands of interactions and it's extraordinarily resilient. So just like, you know, your baby probably has cried and fussed in the car seat and you've left her crying and fussing in the car seat while you're driving because you can't unbuckle the baby and hold her while you're driving and say like, oh, sorry, my baby just really doesn't like her car seat and I hate to hear her cry. Like, no, you know that okay, she needs to figure it out because I need her to be safe. Mm -hmm. And so if you can apply the same gentle principle that says, okay, sometimes my baby's going to protest because she wants something different. But as her mom, I know that I am providing her with what she needs and she will learn this. There's just some growing discomfort. Then we can feel empowered and we can let go of some of that guilt to know that this isn't this awful, selfish baby torture that's only benefiting us. It's, it's calculated and it is so responsive. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's tuning into baby, tuning into your motherhood and it's, it, nothing is one size fits all for everything, but it is figuring it out like, okay, maybe this can work for us, you know? Yeah, exactly. And like I said, like if parents don't want to do any cry it out, if they just don't feel like their baby is old enough and they don't want to teach them to self-soothe yet, that's fine. You can sleep train without crying it out. Mm -hmm. And so like it it doesn't matter how you optimize sleep as long as you do. Right, right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And thank you for explaining that because I know that as soon as a lot of people hear sleep train, they're tuned out. Totally. Yes. You know, because it's like, oh, we don't do that or I don't believe in that. And it's 
I mean, the point of this podcast is to bring on different experts such as yourself and different people to just educate us on the information out there and maybe even some of the myth, the myths or misinformation out there so that we can make the best informed decisions for ourselves, our families, and be, you know, the best moms and women and friends and supporters that we can. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, what is your website if people want to check out all of the resources that you have on there? Yeah. So I'm the peaceful sleeper. So the website is the peaceful sleeper.com. And then on Instagram, I'm at the dot peaceful dot sleeper. Awesome. Thank you, Chrissy, so much for coming on and for sharing this information and telling us all about it. And I'm definitely going to check out the insomnia course. I don't feel like I have insomnia. It's just like weird seasons. Like I'll have a few weeks of not good sleep. And then Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what's going on lately. (laughs) Yeah. I bet you'd be like a really quick fix that just applying a couple principles can just reset you and get you back to sleeping well. Yeah. Because I love sleep and I just feel like I feel so much better. I'm just a better woman (laughs) when I have totally. (laughs) Yes, totally. I think we all are. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to definitely have to check that out. So thank you so much for, for coming on. And for those... You guys, we didn't tell this at the beginning, but I had no idea that she lived in Las Vegas, which I used to live in Las Vegas. And then my friend from Vegas met her on a flight to Whitefish, which is where Vito and I got married. I was like, oh my gosh, you have to talk to this lady. So that's how we ended up exchanging information and meeting each other. So you just, you never know how you meet people. (laughs) I know. That's so fun. It's such a small world. I know. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yes. Thank you. I am so excited to check out her insomnia guide. Uh, I don't know what's going on with me lately, but I do know that I am a happier person when I have more sleep. And honestly, I was super excited to talk to her just because I do have fears becoming a mom one day, hopefully. And I am somebody who needs sleep. I know people who are like, oh yeah, I'm fine, whatever. And I know that they say when you have a baby, you learn how to do it. And I'm like, man, but I need somebody to tell me that that I can survive it or give me tools and resources to get through it because uh, I'm not fun if I don't have tons of sleep. Not tons of sleep, just enough sleep. So um, I feel like I there was a lot of information in there wherever you're at on your journey and also just happier, healthier relationships come from better sleep. Um, and I was looking up some more statistics and it was 75% of people who suffer from depression also suffer from lack of sleep. So there is a correlation there. There's something linked and restoring your body um, gives your body, your mind, body, and and spirit time to rest and to recover. And it is really important. And it's definitely something that we're like, you can sleep when you're dead. Everybody's heard that statement. And it's like, Nah, dude, (laughs) I can sleep now because my body needs it and you do need it as much as you think sometimes you don't, um, trying to find a routine. I can't even imagine, um, adding kids to the situation and stuff. So I know that it has to be really hard, but there, there are resources out there and Chrissy has a bunch on her website. So don't forget to check that out. If you guys are listening to this and you are not subscribed to the podcast, hit the subscribe button and uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, join our Facebook group, and just share this with somebody who may need to to hear it. And uh, always reach out to me if you guys have any questions or topics that you really want us to, to address or bring people on for. Just reach out to me because um, I would love to hear hear what you guys want to hear this next year. So I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and I will talk to you next week.